what you are about to see in the next 45 minutes is actually a product of this conference and this movement. These three guys, uh, Frederick, Lorin, Sven Bergman and Joachim Düfemark have been going to the global conferences for more than 10 years. They have gotten a lot of help from a lot of you people to do at least 10 amazing investigative projects uh, the last 7 to 10 years. They won three Swedish Pulitzer Prizes. And I talked to Frederick just uh, uh, a short uh, while ago and he told none of these projects and none of these awards had, had been possible without the help from the Global Investigative Journalism Network and the movement that we have created. So, I would welcome to the stage the Troika. Vi är övertygade om att tillgång till telefoni och internet bidrar till utveckling av såväl ekonomier som mer öppna samhällen och att det därför finns det är därför det är bättre att vi finns på plats även i länder där det idag finns mer att önska vad gäller yttrandefrihet och mänskliga rättigheter. Hello. Hello. Morning. Could you please ask where they are taking you? Is it far away? The young person that we were about to institute paralysis. What happened to you said to him? So Alla på min nivå vet hur systemet fungerar, vad säkerhetstjänsterna gör med det. Men vi diskuterar aldrig konsekvenserna. Det är tabu. Uh, a company called Takiland. Yeah. Maybe it was an arrangement that they said, well, you know, let's use Takiland as some kind of stooge company. The entity that gets named, but is not the power behind the button, so to speak, the puppet. She is deeply, deeply feared. She's feared by you know, individuals just for where, who she is, uh, because she's the daughter of the president. She's feared by businessmen uh, who fear her or one of her associates uh, being too interested in their business. She's feared the average person in the street uh, would simply be uh, afraid. So let me state clearly, there is zero tolerance of corruption and bribery at Telia Sonera. This is extremely important to me personally and something we pay attention to every single day. I have said it before and I will repeat it. Telia Sonera did not bribe anyone. Telia Sonera did not participate in money laundering. Allt har ett pris. Särskilt en stor affär som det här var. Vill man komma till ett avslut så måste man vara beredd att betala. Och vi betalade. Ett öppet pris och ett hemligt. Telia Sonera did not bribe anyone. Telia Sonera did not participate in my own. During, during this next hour, we will try to take you on a tour that reveals how Western companies act in brutal dictatorships like Uzbekistan, Azerbaijan and Belarus. It will be about monitoring, it will be about phone tapping, bribes and money laundry. But it's also a story about the strength of journalism. How we as reporters 
can make change despite lack of resources, compared at least to the companies and states that usually are involved. And the key word here is international cooperation. For the past 15 years, almost all our stories have been international, because national topics today are global. And our recipe and the key to success in the research is to work with colleagues like yourselves on a reporter to reporter basis. And we'll try to show you some examples. But let's start by going back in time to 2008, January 8. It's an ordinary day in the um, news factory. Hillary Clinton is losing against Barack Obama in New Hampshire. In the UK, the cabinet has approved a new generation of power plants. And in Kenya, yet another report about clashes. But in Uzbekistan, there's a Swede in the media center. Telia Sonera's CEO, Lars Nyberg. Local media reports from Tashkent where Nyberg proudly declares that the newly bought company Ucell will become the largest telecom operator in Uzbekistan. Nyberg and his closest man, Tero Kivisari, here to the right, have just bought a well sought 3G license in the country. In exchange, a local partner have received 2.2 billion Swedish crowns. That's more than 350 million US. The men will continue the very same day to a new meeting, this time without cameras. On a local restaurant in the outskirts of Tashkent, they will discuss the future of Ucell with this woman. Gunara Karimova, also known as the Princess of Uzbekistan, the daughter of the dictator Islam Karimov. She has uh, no formal position or role over the Uzbek telecom market, but she is the one who decides who gets into the country and there is a price tag to it. It will take four and a half years uh, before the bribery affair is being disclosed. And all hell will break loose for Gulnara Karimova, Lars Nyberg, and basically all the other people involved in the affair. Och kväll och välkomna till rapport. Ja, Telia Sonera har alltså betalt 2,2 miljarder kronor till ett litet brevlådeföretag i skatteparadiset Gibraltar. Bolaget kontrolleras av en ung. So, uh, how did it all start for us? When is an idea becoming an international investigation? In our case with Telia Sonera, it started in 2011 during the Arabic Spring. When the Mubarak regime fell in Egypt, the Cairo headquarters of the infamous state security got raided by demonstrators. I don't know if Hisham Alam is here with us now. He's probably sleeping. One of our friends and colleagues, he was there. Uh, a lot of the files at the state securities were destroyed. But there were documents that surfaced showing how Western companies were closely cooperating with the Mubarak regime in monitoring the people. We thought, well, let's look at the Swedish export companies. And we quite soon narrowed down to Telia Sonera, the good old telecom company, known to most Swedes as a state institution providing telecom services in our country. But Telia Sonera had transformed, becoming a global player with ambitions to grow. And in the hunt for lucrative markets, the company focused on Central Asia, a region well known for human rights abuses. Telecom is powerful. It can help and create revolutions, but at the same time, as we all know, it's an effective tool 
for regimes to control and monitor people. Our question was, how do Western telecom companies like Telia Sonera act in this environment? Vi tillhandahåller kommunikation och vi ska göra dem i de säkraste näten som överhuvudtaget går att uppbringa. Det bygger relationen med våra kunder på. Så det handlar om att ha säkra nät men också hantera data och personuppgifter på ett, ett säkert sätt. Telecom is good for democracy. Telesonera CEO Lars Nyberg said. We follow the law in each country, just as in Sweden, he said. We saw that it was easier for te easy for Telia Sonera to dismiss general criticism of the company's presence in the region. So we decided to find uh, detailed evidence from each country in the belt of dictatorships where Telia Sonera now operated. Technical evidence and cases of innocent people getting their rights violated by the regimes with the help from Telia Sonera. But, as most of you have experienced, it's not easy to dig in another country. It's another language, another culture, no sources. So the key for us was to network with NGOs, human rights, lawyers, political opposition, and most important, fellow reporters. Like Khadija Ismailova, as Ray. most of you know. Open doors in Azerbaijan. Right. Right. Roman Anin in Russia. Ilya Kuznetsu in Belarus. Right. And Andreas Hedfors and many, many more. With their and many others' help, we were able to find a lot of examples, concrete examples, from every country in the region where Telia Sonera operated. And documents revealing how Telia Sonera and the other Western telecom companies gave the security services full access to the customers, letting the regimes into the backbone of the telecom system, enabling 24-7 surveillance, real-time, monitoring, positioning, tapping, reading text traffic, closing down phones and whole networks. 3G, forever, yeah, all the way. <laughs> En koncern, ett varumärke. Uppdraggranskningskartläggning visar att samtliga av Telia Soneras bolag i diktaturbältet samarbetar med säkerhetstjänsterna i regimernas jakt på kritiker och oliktänkande. Några exempel. Georgien. Inte en diktatur. Men heller inte en demokrati. Säkerhetstjänsten använder här telekommunikationen som vapen mot opposition och den fria pressen. Under demonstrationer i maj förra året blir det kravaller. Två personer dör. Flera fotografer som dokumenterar våldet får efter det sina telefoner avlyssnade. Delar av samtalen spelas upp i tv när fotograferna senare grips och anklagas för spioneri. Abonnemang, Telia Soneras, Geocell. One of many, many examples that we could show. As many of you know all too well in your daily work as journalist under oppressive regimes, there are challenges. How do we communicate when everything is being monitored? How do we evaluate information? And most important, how do we protect sources and others that we talk to? Like in Belarus. Before going to Belarus, we spoke to over 100 people in and outside the country. We tried the best we could to protect them, uh, often uh, learning them how to, to use encryption and so on and so on. But there is a great dilemma when you as a journalist just doing your job inevitably put others at risk. And at one occasion in Belarus, things got a bit out of, out of control. Vi har stämt möte med en och en person som ska berätta om mobiloperatörens samarbete med regimen. Och det är nu det händer. Hello. Hello. Good morning. 
Raman Pratasevich. 16 år, känd ung aktivist som uppmärksammats i internationell media och life-kund. Vi vill intervjua honom om att även han, trots sin ålder, avlyssnats av KGB. Istället beordras vi allihop in i en minibuss. Could you please ask where they are taking you? The governor's resort. Is it far away? No, no. Det är den här mannen som för kommandot. Han beskrivs som länken mellan polisen och KGB. Fotografen Ola Kristoffersson lyckas filma med sin mobiltelefon. Vi har alla tillstånd som utländska journalister här behöver och förstår inte varför vi grips. Än så länge är den unge Raman med oss, men inte länge till. Polisen tar nu våra mobiler. Och trots att vi protesterar kopierar de allt material i vår kamera. Det känns olustigt. Men vi har svenska pass och är ändå trygga. Det som oroar oss är att den 16-årige Raman skilts från oss. När vi efter tre timmar släpps och får tillbaka telefonerna slår vi i smyg på inspelningen igen. The young person that we were about to institute paralysis. Okay. Okay. What happened to you? So, are we at your office? We were not at the office. Yes, we were arrested. So we saw him. No, but we always do that. Seriously, is he arrested? I know. Seriously, the home, the home. Is it home? Sure. What did you do? You write the script, so you can go home and show your report. Let's go. 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 Let's go.
Men vi har bett att få tala med eh, vdn Lars Nyberg. Just det. Och Lars är ju inte tillgänglig. Han är i landet just nu. I vilket land är han? Var är han någonstans? Lars, han är helt enkelt på resa. Eller? Jo, jo, men du ja. vet vilket land han är. Han är på resa. Fredrik Larin. Hej, Cecilia Edström. Tjena. Kör vi. Har ni mutat Karimov-regimen i Uzbekistan? Vi har fått ett antal detaljerade frågor från er och de har vi svarat skriftligen på. Samtidigt är det viktigt för mig här och nu att ge Telia Soneras övergripande syn på Uzbekistan. Vi kör igen. Har ni mutat Karimov-regimen i Uzbekistan? När vi gjorde vår investering i Uzbekistan 2007 då undersökte vi att den motpart vi hade då var den rättmätiga ägaren av de licenser och de frekvenser som vi senare tilldelades. Och att den person som representerade bolaget också hade mandat att göra det. Men frågan, har ni mutat Karimov-regimen i Uzbekistan? När vi gjorde vår investering 2007 så undersökte vi om motparten var den rättmätiga ägaren nu och ge till att soneras övergripande syn på motpart vi hade på den rättmätiga ägaren. She was very well paid. She's fired now. Um, Uzbekistan is among the worst of the worst when it comes to corruption. Anybody who had any contact with the country or its dictator Islam Karimov knows. Still, Telia Sonera claimed that entering the country back in 2007 was done by the book. Extensive due diligence and according to all ethical principles. But what we saw was a multinational company paying hundreds of millions of dollars to a local partner called Takilant. And it turned out that the local partner wasn't very local. In fact, it was an offshore company registered in Gibraltar. And all of the alarm clocks went off at the same time. That meant uh, new research, new countries, and new reporter-to-reporter -reporter cooperation uh, to start working with. Miranda Patrucic from OCCRP, and <laughs> Uv Steiner from Swiss TV. Sorry. <laughs> Helped us out. We went through all the financial records in Sweden, in Holland, where Telia Sonera have holding companies, and Gibraltar. And we found that there was something wrong. The money that Telia Sonera claimed that they paid to Gibraltar were to be found in the financial records. And then the owner. Telia Sonera claimed it was a local businesswoman in Tashkent with a 3G license. Surprise. Well, her name is Gayan Avakayan and she might be a businesswoman but not telecom. Men frågan är befogad. Uppdrag granskning kan nu avslöja ett nät av kopplingar som visar att Telia Soneras partner står diktatorns dotter nära. Se här. Telia Soneras motpart är Gayan Avakayan och företaget Takilant från Gibraltar till vilket Telia Sonera ger 2,2 miljarder svenska kronor. I Uzbekistans huvudstad driver Gulnara Karimova ett modeföretag, House of Style. Där satt Gayan Avakyan för några år sedan i ledningen. När Gulnara Karimova organiserade en utställning om usbekisk konst som bland annat turnerade i Sankt Petersburg var Avakyan projektledare. Och året innan affären med Telia Sonera satt de tillsammans i en modejury i Tashkent. Gayan Avakyans bolag Takilant i Gibraltar har också ett dotterbolag i London, Penali. Och sekreteraren där sitter också i styrelsen för Odenton som ägs av den som pekas ut som Gunnara Karimovas pojkvän. En av Odentons ledamöter är också vd för det usbekiska kulturcentret i Genève, där Gulnara Karimova är ordförande. Gajan Avakyan och Gulnara Karimova, här tillsammans på bild, tagen i år på Diors modemässa i Paris. 
Going through the financial records, searching on internet and talking to exiled Uzbeks. By doing that, we could show that Telia Sonera's partner, in fact, was Gunara Karimova's personal assistant. But every successful project needs a bit of luck. Um, just three days before this very important picture was taken, Gunara Karimova makes a great mistake. She sends Gayan and two other Uzbek citizens to Switzerland in order to rescue Telia Sonera's bribe millions. The mission uh, that Gayan gets from Gulnara, her boss, is to go to the private bank Lombard Odier in Geneva and say, I am the rightful owner of a number of bank accounts and not this guy, Beksod Ahmedov. Uh, now, Beksod Ahmedov used to be Gunnar Karimova's financial fixer. He took care of all the um, telecom contracts, he opened and fronted the Swiss bank accounts, and everybody was happy until June 2012, in the middle of our research. There's a clash. He runs away, Gunnar gets pissed off, puts him on the list of wanted people. Then she sends Gayan to Switzerland together with the other two Uzbeks in order to try to reclaim the bank accounts where all the bribe millions are. But the bank uh, tries to get hold of Bexod and finds him on the list of wanted people. And even if they don't want to, they have to call the police. Gayan managed to fly to Paris to meet with her boss and go to the fashion show, but the other two Uzbeks are getting arrested by the uh, Geneva police. And when our excellent researcher, Mr. Google Alert, finds the article about the arrest, we have a new chapter Tack in land. our story. Hoägaren, Gayana Vakian, är nu i fokus för en stor polisutredning i Schweiz som gäller penningtvätt. Där ingår Telia Sonera, där ingår Takilant. Och jag ställer frågan igen. Har ni mutat Gunnara Karimova och den uzbekiska regimen? Vi har betalat eh, pengar till ett bolag som var den rättmätiga ägaren av frekvenser och licenser i Uzbekistan som vi behövde för att bedriva telekomverksamhet i landet. Vi har undersökt att den person som representerade bolaget hade mandat att göra det. Och, eh, Därutöver har vi inte haft möjlighet att belägga om det fanns några andra personer bakom eller vilka de var. Tack. Tack. Tack så mycket. Det finns en fråga och det är om ni medvetet, vänta, om ni medvetet har mutat den karimska regimen eller inte. Joakim, jag har svarat på de frågor ni har. Du har sagt att du har kontrollerat Takilands bakgrund, men jag vill veta. Har ni förhandlat med Karimov-regimen om ersättning via Takilan? Ja. Har ni medvetet? Jo, okay, men jag har gett de frågor jag har att ge just nu. Ja, men det, det är en viktig fråga. Jag, ska, ja, jag hör dig. Jag ska gärna analysera de, de saker ni kommer upp med. Men eftersom jag inte har helhetsperspektiv ja, men frågan, har ni medvetet? alla informationerna så kan jag inte kommentera det just nu. Jag har gett de frågorna jag har. Men det är jätteenkelt. Har ni mutat Karimov-regimen medvetet? Ja eller nej? just didn't want to answer the question. But the deal in Uzbekistan uh, was not an exception. Uh, quite the other way around. Uh, together with Ola Westerberg from the Swedish news agency TT and Miranda Patrucic from OCCRP, we managed to show that using a local agent in Central Asia was systematic. We continued the work that Khadija Ismailova had started before she got sent into prison and could show that Telia Sonera, through a very complex system, had added some six, six billion Swedish crowns. That's like five, six hundred million US into the hands of the private pocket of Ilham Aliyev. Uzbekistan was, in and for sig, 
två miljarder tyckte vi var mycket då. Men det här är ju belopp som inte man kunde drömma om att man skulle betala ut eller bidra med. Over the past 15 years, almost all of our stories have been international in one way or another. A lot of the important topics for all of us to investigate today are international. Energy, food industry, pharmaceuticals, arms deals, migration, tax, drugs, terrorism, surveillance, just to mention a few. They're all global. And at the same time, the media landscape is changing. We are getting less viewers, less readers and less resources in traditional media. The key for us to solve this problem has been networking. An international cooperation, it can be many things. It can be a phone call to a colleague to get a simple document from a database that he has. It can be a huge international cooperation with hundreds of journalists under the wings of an organization like the ICIJ. It's also attending conferences like this, not so much to listen to boring lectures like this one, but rather what happens in the break afterwards. Networking. That's what happened in Amsterdam in 2005 at the Global Investigative Journalism Conference. We stalked David Lee, who was then head of the investigative department at The Guardian. Mm. David is over there. Give him an applaud. <laughs> he, he did not just buy us the coffee. He listened to us, and we skipped the next session and the next. And that evolved into uh, weeks and months of intense corp um, cooperation. Because David and his colleague um, Rob Evans had investigated thoroughly BAE Systems, who were selling the Swedish jet fighter Gripen, produced by the Swedish arms manufacturer Saab, with bribes, our research told us. But we needed more proof, and we wanted to cooperate with David and Rob. But to get Swedish television's bureaucracy to contact the Guardian's bureaucracy and to work on some, some kind of joint venture, that was not going to happen. So instead, we took David for the coffee, and he paid for it, and it all <laughs> ended up... He did not. Well, I think so. I, I, sounds better that way. Anyway, we ended up with people like this, which is Manst uh, uh, Alphonse Menstorf Puyi, which is the agent that BAE and Saab used to bribe the politicians in East Europe to buy the Gripen. We also worked with Martin Staudiger. We worked with Sam Sol and Stefans Brummer in South Africa. There was a big deal where the South Africans bought the Gripen as well from BAE and Saab. And finally, we managed to get all the way to the Czech foreign minister who confirmed the bribes on hidden camera. And then it was a truly international cooperation because the team was two business intelligence agents, Mr. Kershaw and Rob Evans, who was Dr. Miller. And they met with the unsuspecting foreign minister and got this on tape. The fact that um, uh, money change hands was, uh, in the parliament at least, a uh, pretty well-known well known secret uh, shared by, by a large number of people. Um, it went across the um, political spectrum. Footage that now is part of, of Swedish modern history. But reported to report a cooperation which has been so su su successful for us started really for us uh, a number of years earlier. In 2004, we investigated, uh, we were some of the first to investigate the US program called Extraordinary Rendition, which was their illegal hunt for suspected terrorists. CIA agents traveled around in, in business jets like this one. Uh, they snatched suspected terrorists from the streets and then they flew them to countries like Egypt, Syria, Morocco, where the security services could torture them and ask questions that the CIA wanted answered. The very same day that we published that story in 2004, Stephen Gray here published 
the same story, or rather a very similar story in New Statesman about U.S. detention camps, secret U.S. detention camps. We got in touch with him immediately, and we started cooperating. And over more than four, uh, we managed, together with Stephen, to uncover a network of flights, U.S. flights, um, of more than four years of CIA flights, snatching people all over the world. International research takes good reporters from around the world. This is Masood Anwar from Pakistan. He was really crucial. This is Leo Sisti from Italy, also crucial for the, uh, for the... And this is, of course, Seymour Hirsch, who got in touch with us and who we then cooperated with. And, of course, without Yosri Fouda in Egypt, we wouldn't have gotten anywhere near where we got on that story. We've learned three things in working this way, reporter to reporter. And that is that there are actually high-profile super reporters out there who are willing to work with no names from the North Pole, like ourselves. Most people in America don't know the difference between or Switzerland and, and Sweden. And that's the kind of approach you get when you call. But there's a different thing if you can get to work with an American reporter that can help you out. But they can also produce re uh, research that is impossible for us to produce because we don't have the money or the resources. And it usually costs nothing because they do it for free. And most of the time they don't screw you. But you have to find a way to offer them something. That is super important. So before approach them, think about what's in it for them. You can ask a favor once, you can do it twice, but the cooperation needs to be based on a win-win situation. So share your research and decide upon a common day of publishing. That's what we did with Rune. Rune Utreberg here is from Norway. We did international fishing, illegal fishing, and we couldn't have done it with him and Johannes Christiansson from Iceland. Their local research and local knowledge was absolutely important for us. Ulla Haram, uh, Mikael Lander from Expressen, Ryan Gallagher, Marina Woke Guevara, and Inga Springe. Those are just a few of the names that have played crucial parts in our uh, successful reporting for the last couple of years, the last 10 years. The unsuccessful uh, is our responsibility. <laughs> There's an old credo from the IRE in the US that says, compete until deadline, then cooperate. Well, we have drawn another conclusion. International cooperation needs to be done before deadline if we are going to stand a chance against the states and the, and the corporations that are up against us. <clears throat> so let's get back to and sum up before questions the story about Swedish Finnish telegiant Teljasonera. What has happened? We, the Swedish Public TV, uh, have published six documentaries about the company, the surveillance and the corruption. It's been, uh, I could say, an interesting journey and the number of journalist friends in our network has grown. So far, a number of police investigations has been started. In Sweden, Norway, the Netherlands, Latvia and Switzerland. And the Americans have also stepped into the arena. Both the US Securities and Exchange Commission and the US Department of Justice are now hunting bad guys and millions of dollars. The Teljasonera management and most of the board were fired. Five top executives are suspected of bribery, including the former CEO, Lars Nyberg. Remember what he said in the start of the presence. Uh, if convicted, they risk imprisonment for up to eight years. And just three weeks ago, the Telesonera's new management decided to sell all their companies in this region. Not only in Uzbekistan, Azerbaijan and Kazakhstan, uh, countries that we were reporting about, but all seven investments that they have in this area. Telesonera now say they can't operate in these countries without breaking the law. That's a big change from what were they repeating and repeating just three years ago when we started to dig into the story. 
The bad will and the possible lawsuits overrose, overshadowing the prophets. Well, as Frederick already said, conferences like this one are important for us. Not because of sessions, not so much, that's good as well, but because of you, the participants, the discussions, the meetings, and the sharing of business cards. We are three guys, only two business cards. That's because <laughs> Frederick left us for the radio. So whatever you do, never call him. Call you or him or me. <laughs> uh, well, if you come uh, across a story, please give us a call if it has a Swedish or, or a Scandinavian connection to it. Or if you need help, we will do anything we can to try to help you. And we hope to call some of you in the very near future. Cooperation rules. So I think we have some time for questions, if there are any. Thank you. Uh, I think he brought some business cards as well. <laughs> At the radio, we have uh, business cards with slightly higher resolution. So if you take one of my cards, you might, you might find the number call. <laughs> and here are the ones in paper with very good resolution. <laughs> okay, before uh, we open for questions, I have one question to you. Is it correct that your investigations with the uh, Telesonaria is the, could it be the biggest bribe scheme in history? You're talking about one billion US dollars paid to, to it's, this. Uh, it's absolutely the biggest in Sweden, and I would assume it's the biggest in Scandinavia. When it comes to worldwide, no. Maybe. Uh, um, it's not a bribe until they're convicted, though. It's important to say that. But um, it's, it's a huge sum. It depends also what you define as the biggest bribe. The biggest bribe known. Yeah, yeah. 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 that's important. But it, if you look at the, the, the top list of the, the biggest known bribery cases, which are the... Uh, the FCPA cases in America, mm. uh, BAE systems that we mentioned, Alstom, uh, Siemens, Daimler-Benz, etc. Those are the ones who have been uh, most severely hit by US uh, investigations. And the leader is Alstom, who had to pay 800 million uh, US dollars in, in, in uh, fines. And, they, and their bribery was something along 5 billion. Uh, so, we are looking, we have proven more or less, I mean, journalistically shown, uh, s what is it, seven-ish billion crowns, that's 700 million US. But we're looking at, at the possibility of, of one billion US in bribes, one billion US in bribes, only bribes. So, and, and of course, we don't know... Um, how much someone else has bribed someone. But, but, but I mean, BAE system, for example, they had a, a slush fund for, for Saudi Arabia. David knows all about this. A, a huge amount of money. Yeah. Huge. I mean, so, so but for, for sure, in, in Sweden, it's the uh, counting money, the, the, the far biggest so far suspected bribe that we know. Yeah. Okay, we have a question here. Uh, please present yourself and... I'm Shujai Gupta from the Herald Publications in Goa in India. Hi. Uh, you see, the thing is, uh, the connection between India and Sweden as far as bribery cases goes, <laughs> goes back a long way. Uh, we had the Bofors gun scandal, which brought down a government uh, that was Swedish. Then you had the Augusta Westland helicopters again, which got into a huge bribery uh, issue with the Indian government. Uh, and now, of course, this, though it's not connected. Uh, what I wanted to know is that, uh, the, you know, th does this kind of a thing happen a lot, lot in Sweden, uh, number one? <laughs> and, and number two, uh, the more serious part of the question is that which, uh, with watchdogs like you guys, uh, is it, uh, are you sensing that a change is about to come in the sense that, do you think that these major companies which, uh, you know, thrive by bribery, yeah. are they kind of looking at themselves a little more... Uh, Differently, are they are they you know yeah. uh, looking out for you guys and doing a less of what they normally do? I can ask you first uh, answer your first question. Well, ironically, I think Sweden is like top three or top four in in um, the index for not bribing. 
Transparency International. Transparency International's index. But, you know, that's bribes within the country, within, within uh, the system. Sweden is, by tradition, an, an, an export country. In that list, we don't know what, uh, what our ex export company is. I mean, Bofors is, is, is still so the, <laughs> the, the role model for bribing in, in also very uh, have, a, have a strong sort of position in, in, in the minds of Swedes. What, what do you say, uh, Joachim and Fredrik, about if it's changed? I think it does, but maybe yeah. you want to fill it in. It does, but not, I mean, also remember that Sweden is, has an official secrets act that, that is 300 years old and that states, uh, and still works in a way, and it states that everything in, that the government has is a public document and should be given out to the public if it's not a, a medical journal or whatever. So, and that still works. And that, that sense of transparency is still the model in, in, Swedish, in the Swedish government, for example. That's what they want to live up to, or say that they want to live up to. So that makes the job a slightly easier for us, or for, compared to, for example, David uh, at The Guardian, who has to work uh, a lot more behind the scenes with his sources in the, in the UK uh, than we, know, we do. I mean, we also use sources, of course, but there's a difference here. And to the question of whether they change, uh, I think they do, I mean, the corporations. I think they let get less corrupt, in a sense. Not so much because of us, but partly because of all of us. Because when we bring out this, they get thrown in jail, not in Switzerland, not in Germany, not in Sweden, but in America, the land of the free. <laughs> the one who we'll really like to investigate when it comes to the war on terror, because there is some real important criticism there and respect for the law. But when it comes to the Foreign Corruption Practices Act, FCPA, that's probably the most beautiful thing I ever written, uh, read. It's, it's a fantastic <laughs> piece of legislation that actually says, you bribe someone, wherever it is, in whatever circumstance, you go to jail. And they, t and they put people in jail. There are a number of German Siemens executives now, right now, in Germany, out of their own pockets, paying for lawyers, trying to fight extradition to the US for having been part of Siemens' multi-million dollar bribery operation. And they are thrown out of Siemens, and the German government is not protecting them, and they are now fighting for their lives. This is what Lars Nyberg is possibly facing, and that's what his successor is, th is thinking about this very day, when he is selling out all of Eurasia, for example. That's a very positive way of looking at things. Mm. And then we have Joachim. <laughs> if you look at Uzbekistan, and if you look at uh, Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and, and we, we came up with a, with a, a name, the belt of dictatorship. Um, if you look at the modus operandi on how export companies work in this region, there is, there is no trend in a positive direction. Um, and and uh, I would urge anyone here to investigate your export companies if they are in this region, because at least it's, it's my understanding that it's absolutely impossible to work uh, uh, in these countries without paying substantial bribes. And, and uh, uh, there's no positive trend in Azerbaijan, quite the other way around. There's no positive trend in Uzbekistan. So maybe there's a trend in you have to have a good uh, uh, ethical, uh, like ethical principles. And maybe uh, it's more difficult to hide the transactions, the infrastructure, um, especially when there's a, an information exchange agreement between a lot of Western countries and, and the classical offshore entities. It's more difficult to hide the, 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 the chain of money, but to say that they don't bribe in this region, it's not just true. 
And also, Sweden got a just uh, 30 seconds. Sweden has got a lot of internally criticism from OECD uh, within the European uh, mm. uh, for not really taking the, the companies to court. For example, in, in the story we did with, with, with uh, uh, David, David and Rob, Lee yeah. and, and Rob Evans, uh, the prosecutor in Sweden, in uh, trying to get this uh, thing to court, had one policeman who couldn't speak English, mm. investigated. You know, so, so it's, it's, I, I agree that it, it's very much up to us, all of us here, I think, to be a pain in the ass. And I, I have a follow-up question. Is it true that there's an expression, Bufosh is, is the, the name of the company, is it true that in India, if something is really fucked up, you say, it's totally Bufosh? Bribe amount is uh, twice the bribe amount that Bofors paid. They we would say two Bofors or three. It's standard terminology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's another question here. All right. My name is Ahmad Isa from Nigeria. Hi. I came from a country where my former president was quoted as saying. Stealing is not corruption. Now, you were mentioning countries like um, all the tanks, 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 which means uh, I may not be able to pronounce the names correctly, but you remember the tanks, tanks, Uzbekistan, tanks, tanks, yes. Now, the kind of bribery that has been going on in Nigeria has been there for ages in the oil industry, mm -hmm. in every aspect of our lives. The only hope we have now is the new government that we have that has given us an impression that it is willing to fight this. But believe you me, uh, in one of the sessions yesterday, somebody from my country was trying to defend my country. A country, I've been jailed severally, I've been uh, humiliated, I've been almost killed because of uh, 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 I, what we have been doing, trying to expose all the rots in our society. Now, do you know that Nigeria is the only oil producing country that does not know the quantity it produces and the amount of money that comes in. In my country, Nigeria, mm. you can't do any business before this government. Mm. And you can't do any business, even you there, if you come to Nigeria and you want to do anything meaningful, no matter how benefiting it would be you must grease palms. Yeah, yeah. If you don't give bribe, nobody will be willing to work with you. Even and, if and it that is... is true, that is true for this, the stand countries, as no, we sometimes call no. it. So you are right. My I plea mean, here is, how, how can we get, gain some kind of support from people like you that are willing to support upcoming people like us mm -hmm. from third world countries like Nigeria? I'll, I'll give you a very short and distinct answer to that very good question. And that is that all of the faces you have seen up here, David, Stephen, whoever, Roman, nice people and they play their part. But there are a number of people in this investigation and in all of our investigation that will never show up on a screen like this. And those are, for example, colleagues like yourself, who, for names, I mean, there are no Uzbeks here, right? You didn't see any Uzbek faces. Do you think you need some sources in Uzbekistan if you're doing a story like this? Well, you can make your own conclusions. That is what I'm saying to you. 
we, re we, are really, we really care about the situation in Africa and the development in Africa. And I've been thinking a lot about the Liberian situation with Ebola, but also about the shipping registry that is actually run out of New York and who all Swedish com um, shipping companies, they are, they are registered in Liberia, great place to be registered. The money goes to New York, there's no money in Liberia for health care. I, I was, honestly, I didn't do it, but I really want to do the cooperation with someone there to show that fact. So I think what we need to do is to exchange business cards, and I'm happy to do a story about uh, uh, Nigeria with your help. That's the short answer. Yeah. <laughs> do you want the long one? <laughs> yes, uh, just a question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Wait, wait. Oh, you must have mine. Right. I just wonder about the, uh, the consequences for the Queen of uh, Uzbekistan. What happened there? And uh, did this uh, documentary have any consequences for the leaders in the belt of corruption? Oh, you, you mean the, um, the Gunara and the other... Oh, that, well, that's interesting. Uh, Gayan and uh, Gunara's boyfriend and Yekaterina, uh, that was a financial assistant, they are now in jail in Uzbekistan being scapegoats. Gunara Karimova ended up in house arrest prior to the president election but I think that had more to do with her, you know, freaking out on Twitter uh, about her family. It, it became too much. Her life has changed. She was, a, um, she was getting into the warmth. She was uh, going, uh, there was pictures here from, uh, together with a very famous jewelry family. They, she was going to Cannes, entering the red carpet. She was... Even though she was a dictator's daughter, she was on her way into the fancy society in the States and, and, and Europe. She can't travel anywhere. She's in, I think she's still in house arrest. It's very difficult to get information. When it comes to Azerbaijan, nothing has changed. The family Aliyev is, is getting you know, richer every day. Um, in Kazakhstan, nothing, Belarus, nothing. I would say that Uzbekistan is the only place where, where it had major consequences for the leadership. Um, and that had partly to do with our story, combined with the fact that they were trying to uh, get money out from Switzerland and there was a Swiss investigation about money laundry taking off at the very same time as we did our story. So the combination of those two and her being, you know, a bit crazy on Twitter. Okay, there's, is this on? Yeah, no. this will be the last question. Is this on? Yeah. Uh, I'm from Finland, Sara Rigatelli. I would like to ask two questions. Uh, what kind of methods of communication did you use among the journalists? Did you meet? How often, where did you meet? How did you communicate? securely. And other question, were you able to concentrate only on this for the, for the time that it took or were you running multiple projects at the same time? No, we were, oh, if we only produced the TV documentaries, you mean, the last question. Like, were, yeah. were you able to investigate only on this Telia Sonera case and nothing else? Aha. Uh -huh. uh, how we communicated, well, that was a problem, of course, uh, to communicate in a secure way with people in countries like this. For example, in, in Belarus, we, when we contacted people, uh, we, started to s we tried to set up a secure channel, like, for example, to introduce PGP encryption to them. Uh, we never talked about other persons. I mean, quite basic things. Uh, when you talk with a lot of people in a society like that, there are informers, of course. People co collaborating because they want, because they get paid, because they are threatened or whatever with the regime. So we never na name dropped, you know. We were just talking to one at a time. Uh, but that was a problem. Uh, and it's, it's, it's for sure, you can't do it 100% secure, it's, it's impossible. Uh, we 
produced other uh, reportages during this time. Also, we've been working with this for three years, I think. Uh, Nils Holmson is a very, very tough employer. He's the boss. This is not a vacation. Thank you, Nils, for letting us do this. Now, but you know, we work for, for, for the Mission invest Investigative, a one-hour investigative program in Swedish public TV. Uh, and uh, I think we are privileged uh, that can have time to dig into to major stories like this. Uh, for us, we also produce other stories in the meantime, of course. Uh, but I think we worked full-time, three persons, for about five months before the first story. So that's a lot of time, and of course we are privileged to do that. Yeah. Three persons, five months, yeah. or something. Yeah. When it comes to the security part, I think it's absolutely vital today. If you, if you haven't realized it before, it's vital that you get into the game of, of basic stuff like like PGP, like, like OTR chats, like knowing what systems are, are open to what governments, for example. Um, I would say that it is a shame that there, were, that there were only 20 people trying to learn Mailvelope yesterday. <laughs> and that you all were drinking when there was a crypto party in the other pub where you could drink and learn encryption. I may, I, may I just add a, a thing when it comes to the people that we talk to? Uh, like in Uzbekistan, we, uh, we talk to very experienced NGOs, and we thought that they would know the limit on, on how much we could communicate, even, the, even though uh, we didn't say anything, just the fact that we were communicating was a problem. And in the beginning, we let them if they were experienced, decide on what level we would uh, draw the security. And, and that was a problem. We, um, we screwed up big time in the beginning because people ended up in trouble, even though they were experienced. Mm. So my message is, you have to take responsible, uh, responsibility for all the communications, even though the very experienced people in this in these countries in this in this region might say you know it's fine we can you can skype chat that's that's good you have you have the responsibility and and we were very it was a it was a tough lesson to learn yeah okay uh, we're almost 10 minutes over time it's uh -huh. very un nordic but uh, i will we will admit one last short question Oi. i'm from Turkey. my name is Yildiz Yazıcıoğlu uh, as you know, we uh, choose the dictatorship by the election in our country. So Erdogan's uh, son getting new uh, ship. He has a ship owner now in the Turkey. Actually, sh uh, he's younger than me. <laughs> and how it's possible he get the new ships every month, we don't know. Uh, so I would like to ask, how you tr uh, will track the money, especially Switzerland? Because the bank of sh uh, system, uh, we need to solve the money uh, go to from the Turkey in the Europe bank system. How is it possible? Could you give the hints about that? I think the short answer is that you, you, you have to do the follow the paper trail. The, everything has to be recorded. Even bribery money has to be recorded somewhere. So there, is, there are companies there, there are directors of those companies, and there are annual reports. Uh, even in Cyprus now, they have to produce annual reports, and I think even have to tell you who the, the shareholder is, possibly. I don't So, I mean, just follow the money, follow the, the, the paper. That's all I can say. That's exactly what we did in the Telia Sonora case. We followed the paperwork. We went to Gibraltar, and then we said, "Okay, what else? What other companies does this company own? Mm, Panali, and who is this guy Yan?" That's how we did it. We didn't have any source in the first story when we broke the bribery affair. We were just following financial records. Yeah, and and one lesson that I learned uh, was that. Um, when paying bribes in in this amount. 
it makes uh, it. Uh, I I had the image that a company would have like a slash fund, uh, black money on some account somewhere, and they just paid. But <clears throat> when it comes to to hundreds of millions, there's a very very clear chain of command inside every multinational company. For instance, in the Telia story, the CEO. Uh, uh, he could decide upon 150 million Swedish crowns. That's like... 50 million dollars. Yeah. Mm. That, was, that was the level. He could not make a decision on top of that. So that had to be a board decision. Mm. And, and just to learn on what levels different decisions, decisions were taken, you could pinpoint who knows about this. Mm. Uh, so even if it's bribes, you still have to... to um, they have to keep track of their bribes. Tra you have to leave trails. <laughs> they have to keep track of their bribes. So they have bookkeeping then. They have to... to so there is, a, there is a trace. Okay. Uh, thanks for a very inspiring... Uh, uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening. I think this is all about us.